Before we get into today's episode, I want to thank a couple sponsors that we were able to secure for this season, uh, season five of the Scuttlebutt. It's exciting to be able to get sponsors for this. Uh, we're really thankful for them. Uh, the first one, you might have heard them already, is D&D Metal Recycling and Auto Salvage. The Scuttlebutt's been pairing with D&D for quite some time. Uh, D&D began as a small hauling and used auto parts operation in the Pittsburgh area in the late 1970s and has grown into a full service metal recycling company with two locations, Lawrenceville and Tarentum. These are state-of-the-art scrapyards with deep roots in the community and a strong commitment to the service of their customers. D&D accepts all types of metal, both ferrous and non-ferrous, that may be generated by industrial manufacturing, construction and demolition, small commercial entities, as well as individual customers. They have a wide variety of material handling equipment and are capable of managing any job in a timely and efficient manner. You can contact them for quotes and availability at D and D. That's D and D autosalvage.com. Thank you, D&D, for supporting this podcast. Uh, been wonderful collaborating with you, and uh, we're looking forward to, to being with you uh, all through season five here. We'd also like to thank a new sponsor for the Scuttlebutt, Tobacco Free Adagio Health. Tobacco Free Adagio Health is dedicated to preventing and reducing tobacco use and increasing education about tobacco hazards and secondhand smoke. Of course, the best way to be tobacco free is to never start. And we'll be sharing more about the many programs offered by Tobacco Free Adagio Health in the future. You can check out more of their work at tobaccofree.adagiohealth. That's A D A G I O health.org. Tobaccofree.adagiohealth.org. Org. Um, really excited to have sponsors on board uh, for the Scuttlebutt, and uh, I hope you enjoy this upcoming episode. You know, I, I don't hear nearly enough about what can we do to help other than thank you for your service. It would be nice to see more of the American public engaged in what happens to our military members after they get out of the service. Welcome everyone to The Scuttlebutt. I'm your host, Sean Hall, Director of Programming with the Veterans Breakfast Club, whose mission is to create communities of listening around veterans and their stories to connect, educate, heal, and inspire. And one of the things that we try to do here at the VBC is not talk about politics, um, mainly because we want to make a welcoming environment for everybody and you know, I think that's probably just for the best. Uh, but here on the Scuttlebutt, the podcast of the BBC, uh, we can dive into some of these issues that uh, I think are important to veterans. And that's why this episode is, is titled Veteran Advocacy. We're going to be joined by a couple guests, Dwight Bodorf and Jess King and Ryan All, uh, all three veterans. And we're going to talk about what is veteran advocacy? What is some of the litigation that is happening right now? How, what's the difference between the community and state and national level? Uh, and you know, I, th I think a lot of these things can be really confusing for civilians like myself. So we're going to touch on some of these things that are gonna be coming up in Congress, what they're going to be voting on, how they do that, uh, what's important for veterans in the community level. You know, there's a lot to get into. Um, Jess King was only able to join us for about a half an hour, but we were very happy to have her on board uh, to talk about some of the female issues that are going on right now. And as always, if this is your first time watching The Scuttlebutt, please like, share, subscribe, and ring the bell on YouTube so you're the first to know whenever we release new episodes every Monday. And also drop me a line, Sean, S-H-A-U-N at veteransbreakfastclub.org. Be interested to hear what your thoughts are about this episode or any of the episodes we have. You can get them all wherever you get your podcasts in audio format, or if you want to watch us, you can jump on YouTube where all of our episodes are available on the Veterans Breakfast Club's YouTube channel. Um, thank you so much for watching, and thank you to our sponsors, D&D &D Auto Salvage and Adagio Tobacco Free Health. Uh, we really appreciate having you guys on board. And uh, on with the show. My name is Dwight Barf. I am a township manager here in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Previously, I served as a county veterans director and director of public affairs and patient advocate for a VA hospital. And prior to that, I served with the Light Armored Reconnaissance Battalion in the Marine Corps out of Camp Virginia. Thank you, Dwight. And, and Jess, welcome back uh, also to the scuttlebutt. Uh, if you could give us a bit of uh, introduction for yourself, please. Hello, my name is Jessica King. I'm the District 29 VFW Commander. Um, that's all of Allegheny County. Um, I have 36 VFWs in my district. Um, I'm also a, a Marine, um, Iraqi veteran, and also I do work in the veteran space as well. Awesome. And as I said in the intro, uh, you know, here at the Veterans Breakfast Club, we don't usually talk about politics, uh, but talking about the topic of veteran advocacy 
it, it kind of includes a, a bit of politics. So, uh, you know, we're going to talk a, a, about that topic, what's going on in the space um, for today's episode. And uh, Jess, I'd love to go to you first, because I know you're only with us for a short time today. Um, a bit about what is veteran advocacy for just a, you know, a baseline sort of general idea? Uh, and why should it be important to civilians? Right. So, Sean, veteran ad advocacy is very, um, it's very important, especially because we're trying to um, advocate for the veterans in our um, legislation um, with the department. Um, you know, we're Pennsylvania, so it would be our congressmen and women in Pennsylvania and also at the federal level. Um, the VFW um, that I belong to, we are fortunate enough to be able to be those, the, the voices of our veterans in our communities. So, Advocacy for civilians, it's very important to support the VFWs and the American Legions so that we can uh, get these uh, um, these bills pushed through our congressmen and women so that we can make sure our veterans are getting taken care of. And it's not only for the veterans, it's also for the veterans, their family members, um, and also their, you know, their children. So it's very important as a civilian to be a part of this. Dwight, any, anything to add for it? Yeah, I, yes. I add to that um, as well. So for civilians, what they want to think about too, and not only in terms of veteran policy, but oftentimes veteran policy will influence civilian policy. So if you think about World War II and you think about GI Bill and how it transformed the entire American working class into what we now have as the middle class, it had a profound influence kind of on everything in American culture and American life. And a lot of those policies often start out as kind of testing ground in the military and veteran space and then eventually bleed over into civilian life. Uh, other things that veterans advocacy influences, of course, is military policy, things like the draft, right? And that affects everybody. And in today's day and age, we're, you know, we're talking about should it, we bring the draft forward for everybody, women included, and that in turn is also affected by veterans advocacy, military advocacy, and there's a whole bunch of things in the military and veteran space that even though we are a small percentage of the population really does have a large effect on everybody. And so advocacy certainly is important for everybody to, to know about and what's going on with our military veterans. And when we say advocacy for veterans, it, this is all veterans across the board, uh, color, marginalized veterans, uh, disabled veterans, like everyone. Yes. So, and, and, and I can let Jess talk about this a little bit more, but as what we're seeing nowadays is you have your traditional veterans groups, which is like the VFW, what, what Jess belongs to. I also am a member of the VFW, but we're also seeing more smaller specialized groups. We have LGBTQ veterans groups. We have uh, Minority Veterans of America, which is a great advocacy group for um, minority veterans. And we also have other subcategories. You have Disabled Veterans of America, which are specifically for veterans that have disabilities incurred in the line of service. And so there's all these little pockets of advocacy that kind of have their own niche, but they also play into the larger advocacy of the things like the VFW and some of the other major groups are doing. And I want to add, Dwight, it's also the era of the veterans. Like we have the Vietnam Veterans Incorporation, right? We also have, you know, the, the post 9-11 veterans. We also have different pockets of the era groups um, because there's, again, like Dwight said, there are different needs for each era of uh, military service. Can you talk to me a bit about where veteran advocacy is today? You know, it's, it, I hear a lot about how it's come a long way since Vietnam. Um, that a lot of things have changed. A lot of things have changed for the better. Um, but where do we stand as of 2022? Uh, that's an interesting question. Josh, you want to take that one first? I will. So I'm actually really good friends with our um, with our national legislation um, chair chairperson uh, Jim Brown, and he he talks about this a lot of times. Um, we have the Action Corps. Um, it's actually a QR. What is that QR code? It's it's super easy. People can use their, their smartphones, they can scan it, and it will actually pop up. And it's, it takes two seconds. You can register, and all you do, you get emails weekly of what's happening um, with your legislation in, in the veteran space, whether it's for the veterans or their family members. And if you, you know, you just hit submit, and it will send, you don't have to do anything. You don't have to know who your local politician is. 
Um, it will send it to your state rep. It will, it will send it to your local congressperson. It will send it, send it to your state representation. So we've made it so easy now that it's, it's, it should be like, everybody can do this. It doesn't have to be a veteran. You know, if you support a veteran or you have a veteran in your family, I highly recommend doing the Action Corps. And it has become so much easier than it has been in the past. So is this actioncorps.org? Is that the where you would go? Correct. So you can either go to the VFW website, mm -hmm. vfw.org, go under legislation, and you'll see the Action Corps um, link. Um, and I can also send you the QR C it's code. like a QR code, yeah, that you scan. Yeah, it's like a QR code, like when you go to a restaurant now because we can't touch menus, right? It's so simple. <laughs> you can just scan it. And it will, it takes two minutes. If you have an email address, you sign up. There's nothing you need to do. When you say you don't need to know your representative, like, you know, when we said like, yeah, we don't talk politics at VBC, but does veteran advocacy include knowing who your representative is and what they are advocating for? Um, so, yes, yeah. So, you, so. As a, yes, you should know who they are. I'm not saying not to know them, but you know, you know, a lot of us are younger. We don't know a lot about politics. We don't, pick sides, but you do want to know who currently is in office because, you know, they do help you. Um, they have, uh, I just, you know, I know that um, they're bringing service officers into our state representative offices and they're helping them file claims. So, you know, a lot of our um, politicians, they are supporting our veterans, right? And it, it's good to have that relationship, but mm -hmm. Um, with this action core, you, you don't need to know if you, you know, if you, if you don't have the time to find out or you're uncomfortable reaching out. So, you know, action core is a, a great tool to use um, so that we can get these um, important um, legislation passed for our veterans. And I, I would say they're, they're key allies to have um, in my work as a county director and, and both at the VA. Um, they, we would often work with politicians from all sides um, to pass things that, that we felt, the veterans community felt were um, important to veterans, veterans issues, whether that's toxic health bill exposure, things like that, passes here in the state of Pennsylvania to uh, real estate tax exemptions, uh, the parameters for that. So without politicians, a lot of that would be difficult to do. And you have to work across, you know, kind of all the aisle space to make sure that that happens. And that's a, that's a constant engagement with them and they will often lean on um, veteran leaders whether that's it the the big groups the the county the state directors for their input behind the scenes when they're crafting legislation to make sure it really is what the veterans community needs and it's going to fit within kind of the parameters of what they're trying to do and also what's legal or something needs to be completely redone and recreated to to make some sort of new regulation or new law that's what was probably going to be my next question was, uh, what are some of the bits of legislation that are out there right now uh, that are trying to be pushed through Congress, maybe some of the bigger ones? So there's a whole bunch that are always going through. Um, you can look at, um, you know, you can look at it a couple of different ways. So you have your congressional legislation that's being pushed through, and those are the big bills that are going to affect every veteran. And then you also have state level benefits that are going to affect veterans of particular states. So again, here in Pennsylvania, for example, uh, we do have a real estate tax exemption in Pennsylvania for veterans who are 100% disabled from wartime. Mm. Where that becomes a problem in Pennsylvania, for example, and why this is important to work with our legislators and get input from the veterans communities, we might have veterans, we do have veterans who are disabled from things like the Camp Lejeune water. So the water during the 80s in the Camp Lejeune was poisonous. A lot of veterans, um, they developed cancers later in life, all types of things that are totally 100% disabled. They are rated 100% disabled from the Department of Veterans Affairs because of their military service. But because Pennsylvania has that little clause on there that says you must be wartime, those veterans do not become eligible for the real estate tax exemption because of that. Many other states have legislation where it's, doesn't matter if you serve in war or not. If you are 100% disabled for military service, you get some type of exemption. And so working with our legislators and saying, hey, this needs to be passed is, is currently in the works right now for Pennsylvania. And then you go, you know, you take that at the small scale, the state scale. And sometimes those common issues will bubble up to Congress, or maybe there is something that one of the big veterans groups like the VFW have in mind. Um, a lot of things that we saw just recently passed um, and I, I'm sure Jess will have more information for this one too, is for women's health care. They just recently passed that the VA must have a women's health provider at every single VA facility. And so that was something that was really important as our female population in, in the military and veteran space continues to grow. 
That's that's interesting to me because it's you'd think that'd be something they'd already have. If you if you'd asked me as a civilian, hey, do they have you know a, a, a female at the VA? It'd be like, yeah, uh, <laughs> I would think you know. And how how some, soon? Yeah, some VAs do. I know Pittsburgh has. We have it in Pittsburgh at University Drive, but all, not all VAs across the the state have or the nation have the same um, healthcare system. So we're trying to make it you know so that it is uniform across the country. Uh, with Dwight saying about women's health care, we're also pushing for, you know, military sexual trauma. Um, that's another huge one that we are working on trying to get that um, some legislation pushed through. Um, also, infertil infertility. I can't say that word. Sorry, when women can't have children. It's affecting us. Our, our military service has made some of our, our, our veterans, you know, not able to bear ch children. So we're working on making those, um, you know, um, a, a, a disabled claim right, so that these women can get the compensation for those, those issues. And it's not just women, there's also men who, you know, have those issues because of their military service. So, you know, the VFWs and the American Legions and all the VSOs, we're trying to get those things passed through our legislation. Um, I know here in, in Pennsylvania, we're working on the HR 66 Act, which is for our, our service officers to, you know, get more money for our, our accredited service officers so that we can file more claims. Um, you know, Texas and California have two or three accredited service officers. Pennsylvania has 28, but we don't have, we're running out of funding to be able to get our veterans to, um, to get their service officers or to get their claims filed. We are working with the toxic exposure, right? Um, Dwight, I think you're familiar with the toxic exposure. You can talk about yeah. that more. You know, we're working on getting the toxic, the toxic exposure act, you know, pushed through, you know, every so many years it comes out with something new. Let's just make it one big thing instead of like, you know, the veterans keep refiling and then they have to get, you know, it just it just delays the process. And I don't think, that, you know, the civilian side knows that like a lot a lot of it's pushing and delaying the entitlements and some veterans are passing away before the stuff is getting pushed through our legislation. I, I was just having a similar discussion today, Sean. That um, So right now the House just passed a a bill that has to go before the Senate that they want to automatically enroll every single eligible person separating out of the service to the Department of Veterans Affairs. So it's not an automatic process right now. Mm -hmm. And that has created, you know, a little bit of controversy within the veteran space, depending on where, where you side. Um, some people say it's a really good idea because there's a lot of people that don't realize that the process isn't automatic. You know, a lot of people that I've encountered over my, my career who just assume you went to the military, therefore you get VA services. And that's, that is not often the case. There might be a multitude of reasons that somebody is not eligible for VA services or doesn't want to get them. And so now automatically enrolling them, is that a good idea? Is that a bad idea? And, and kind of how do we advocate to, you know, the Senate if this needs to be passed? And how do we then also circle back with the veterans community, those who aren't on board with it and get them on board with it, if we can make that argument? That sounds like a much bigger problem. How how does that process work? Getting the veterans on board with it, or, or yeah, Congress? well, both <laughs> both in a sense. You know, I mean, that's yeah, that's two very different sides that you have to sort of uh, toe the line with, right? It it is, and it can be difficult. And, and I think knowing that you're not going to win probably three quarters of the arguments you're going in for when you're discussing, you know, is with any argument. Most people already have their mind made up, but there are some people that you can sway and you can. You know, you can bring logic into it, you can bring passion into it and, and show them the need. You know, if you've been in inside of the VA system and when we'll throw Ryan out here for this one, because he's, he's over there. Hi, Ryan. Um, when you enroll in the VA system, sometimes it can be difficult and sometimes people don't realize that they need to do it. Um, so oftentimes when I previously worked at the VA, we would have older Vietnam veterans come in. They never signed up when they were when they got out of service because they had a bad experience or they just were treated poorly when they came back. Now they have cancer 50, 60 years later. They want VA to pay for it. They have not filed a disability claim. They make too much money. They were denied a lot of their health care you know, applications. Now, for a lot of them, you can, you can help them. You can file a claim. You can get into service and things like that. But for some people, that whole process is going to take too long. They're not going to have that much life expectancy left. And so bringing up certain stories like that and showing that there's a real need that we could avoid some of that for these veterans if they were automatically enrolled once they got out of the service because for most veterans once you're enrolled in the va system they can't kick you out unless there's some sort of fraud or something else you're in for life now you might have co-pays 
you might have a few other items, but by and large, it's a really good deal. And if you're looking at the cost of cancer treatment, getting that covered at the VA is going to be affordable versus specialized outside. And so making those types of arguments to the politicians, um, bringing in actual human cases, people and saying, please explain your story in person to the senator, this congressman, in addition to facts and things like that, will usually help sway a good number of them. Now, making that same argument to veterans, I wish was as easy. In some cases, it's not. Mm -hmm. We often hear, you know, they're, they're adults, let them make those decisions on their own. They should educate themselves. They should so on and so forth. Um, and, you know, that's, that's a much harder argument to kind of sway somebody to your side of thinking for, of, for certain policies. Yeah. So there's, uh, there's nothing to say as well that as a military person is transitioning out that they, that you couldn't have something to opt out, right. It'd be a lot easier, you know, put them all in. And if you have anybody who's really that, you know, hard charger about not wanting to be in the VA, then you can give them the option to opt out. And I think that that would probably be, um, you know, the best way to do it. And moving, in my experience, you know, working with veterans, there's been very few times, in fact, I can't think of any time where a veteran says, man, I wish I wasn't enrolled in VA healthcare, right? It's typically the other way around. And that maybe that's because those are the people who, who, who find, who, who are trying to find you, right? And get enrolled in VA uh, healthcare. And what, and it, you know, it costs them nothing. So why why not put them in there? And we're we're moving towards um, a system that is going to be an umbrella system that that uh, incorporates both the Department of Defense and the VA. So to try to reduce some of these problems of a veteran enrolling, you know, many years later or even right away coming out of military service, and the VA then having to start a whole new medical file on them, or you know, the the veteran literally walking in like hand carrying their military medical records and giving it to the VA, and you know, there, there's just too many too many hoops to jump through in that point where you know something could get lost or forgotten. But if you have this singular medical history system where everything that happened in the, in the military is now, you know, just you click a button and now it's accessible to members of the VA. I think that would solve a lot of problems for a lot of people. And again, if, if somebody's worried about worried about their privacy or their or wanting to seek health healthcare elsewhere, or just wanting to be done with the entire military veteran, you know, part of their life, you know, they would have that up, that ability to opt out of those sorts of things. Um, so I think that that's probably the best way to move forward. And, and I think, you know, Jess is right that, you know, this, this piecemealing of these conditions, these, and now what we typically call them now is presumptive conditions, right? If you, you get, um, uh, you get these conditions, these cancers that are now linked to Agent Orange is the most typical one. And then you, you know, now you, now you get automatically, you get the, the financial payments and the healthcare that you should have been getting the whole time. Um, you know, why not just include it all right and uh, from the get-go i think it would save a lot of time and effort and make things a lot better for for you know the veterans who are seeking this type of assistance and i think that to ryan's point that's where the adv advocacy comes in right so it's it's up to the veterans groups and the veterans to convince our politicians and other leaders that that that's needed because you know they're going to come back with the arguments of well that's might be free for the veterans not free for the taxpayer that's going to cost money and you know most of us in the veterans community, that that's the right thing to do. Just you put them in war, you pay for them once they come out. But not every politician is going to buy that argument and not every uh, citizen is going to buy that argument, veteran or not. And so part of the whole veterans advocacy is is convincing community peers and, and politicians that that we are worth it and, and to make things easier for the veterans community. It, it does make a lot of sense to streamline things from the Department of Defense to the VA. You need to umbrella things like uh, again, the, the presumptives like Ryan's talking about, as well as um, things spe to specific war zones, burn pit hazards, you know, that's the whole thing right now. And it's going to continue to be for many, many, many years. And there's going to be more and more diseases that crop up. And wouldn't it be great if our generation didn't have to wait 50 years like the Vietnam veterans in Agent Orange to get those, you know, pretty well documented causal links between health issues and service overseas disability payments and health care, why wait 50, 60 years when you could do it now? And back to streamlining, it's not just for the VA um, medical benefits. It's also if the veteran unfortunately has a situation, such if they're homeless or they, you know, they need help with some kind of assistance, 
you know, Dwight, you know, it, it's hard to find those documentation that's needed. If the veteran's already enrolled in the VA healthcare system, it'd be a lot easier for us to get that veteran into a VA a housing program or into a program to where those veterans not living on the street. And it's, it's things like that that have helped propel some of the new innovations at the VA. I, I know, you know, um, you know, there are some systems that you can look up, things like that. And it was because of people, veterans advocates in the community went to the VA or to Congress people and said, hey, we have this problem. We have an idea to fix it. And they were allowed to test out new ideas. So advocacy is fundamentally important to, to pretty much anything during military service and, and certainly post-military service. And I do think the human resources um, departments are starting to catch on to that. And I, I think they're starting to you know, advocate, advocate for, with us and for our veterans. So, you know, I'm starting to see it a little bit, um, especially in the human resources side of things. Um, but, you know, it still has a lot, a lot, long way to go. So, you know, we need to keep pushing it and working on it. One of the biggest uh, current and sort of quote unquote celebrity veteran advocates right now, and I, I bring him up mainly because one of his, his first episode of his new series, The Problem with John Stewart, was all about veteran advocacy in the burn pits. Um, yeah. For our audience members, if you have not seen that, I think it's on HBO Max. If you have a chance, I would I would highly recommend watching that episode because uh, John's been pretty heavy in going to Congress and trying to push through uh, help for uh, veterans who are, are victims of, of the burn pits. And that episode was very enlightening on that fact. Um, when, when we talk veteran advocacy, though, is it only in relation to the VA? It, it seems like that's mainly the thing. Is there other avenues? There there's lots of other avenues. So the, the VA gets a disproportionate amount of attention because they're they're the big government kind of bureaucracy that deals specifically with veterans. Mm -hmm. um, when you're talking about veterans advocacy, then you again you have you have state level, local level, private sector, right? So you have there's often you'll hear a mismatch, and I think it's been talked about in the Veterans Breakfast Club before too, and, and just kind of just mentioned human resources. There's a mismatch between translating what you have done in the military and the skills you have gained to the civilian sector. And it can be hard for veterans with significant job and world experience to land jobs. Um, I have a mentor in, in the new role that I am in who is a veteran. Uh, he ran cities for the army in Iraq and Afghanistan, but had a hard time getting a job as a township manager for a town of 3,000 people or less because the civilians didn't understand what it was that he was doing when he was in the service. And he was running towns of, you know, 30, 40, 50, 80,000 people routinely in multiple countries with multiple other barriers than what's going on. And so advocacy kind of crosses all sectors where veterans are concerned from healthcare to homelessness, to jobs, to relationships as well, and, and everything in between. Hey, Sue, so I just want to let you know, we're here at the Voice of Democracy uh, Banquet. Um, you're here in Lancaster, so we're getting ready to walk our students in. That's a um, light jazz that you're hearing in the background anytime Jess talks. It, yeah. <laughs> yeah, oh yeah, the hotel lobby, you know. <laughs> Jess, I, I want to thank you for coming on the program. I know you have to jump off early, but is there one line of legislation that you are strictly advocating for yourself? And is that too much of a personal problem if we were to talk to a veteran and say, hey, what, what do you want to, to help veterans out going through Congress? So I, for one, I, I, like I was talking earlier, Ryan, Action Corps is the, one of the biggest things that I want uh, veterans, their families, and also the friends of their veterans to start um, looking into. Action Corps is a simple way for um, for us to get the numbers. So when we go talk to our, our our Congress, you know, men and women, you know, they know that we have those votes behind us. So that's one thing. It would be the Action Corps, but also I want to start. We need to start working on advocacy for the women veterans. You know, um, it's been so long um, since we, you know, we're starting to do it. We need to do better. You know, it shouldn't have taken us long for military sexual trauma to be a thing, like not being able to have children, you know, or, you know, unfortunately I had a hysterectomy due to, you know, I had, can I ended up having cancer. So I had to have a hysterectomy and, you know, I'm 30, I was 35 at the time. So that shouldn't have happened in my age, but what are we not seeing, you know, that, that my military service could cause. And, and I'm okay being um, a, a, a test patient or a test person so that we can start getting this legislation and taking care of our, our veteran or our future veterans and, and the, the current military. So I think, you know, pushing for the military, um, the female veterans, I think that's something we need to start looking into and start hitting it hard. 
um, you, Ryan, you know, you were, you know, you know about the, the military sexual trauma. It should have taken us long, right? Back when I was in, in, in 1998, it was even never heard of, right? And it's, it's 2022 and we're just now um, working on legislation for military sexual trauma. And unfortunately, um, women are getting killed and, you know, it had to come, you know, it's just, it's traumatic, the sexual harassment and the sexual assaults that are happening. And it's just now taken this long for us to start getting legislation and um, advocacy for it. Thank you so much, Jess, for being with us on the Scuttlebutt. We're going to look forward to having you back on again. Uh, good luck uh, at the conference there. Yeah, fingers crossed that our district wins. We bring home a win. So yeah. see you guys later. Bye, Jess. Jumping into uh, sort of the next idea I had was that, you know, we, hear, we read a lot or at least I've read a lot about how there are not a lot of veterans now in Congress. They're not getting elected as much as they used to, uh, certainly. And part of that is, uh, you know, it's less than one half of 1% that is in the military. Not a lot of them are coming out and saying, hey, I want to also run for office. Does that make it more difficult to advocate for veterans not having someone who's been there in Congress? Oh, absolutely. Um I read an interesting article a couple of years ago that said part of the reason there's such gridlock in Congress is because there's less veterans. They have less kind of shared background, less items to kind of discuss and talk about. But um, it, it's easier for it to be almost a campaign and talking point than it is for something that's actionable. And so you'll hear a lot of folks, you know, we care about the veterans community, we love our military, but when it comes time to actually introduce legislation or meet with veterans groups or discuss the issues, um, just like in John Stewart's video, a lot don't show up. And the ones who do show up are oftentimes the ones who have either been there directly themselves or they have a vested interest. They hey, maybe have a, a family member, um, something in there of that nature that kind of ties them to the military veterans community a little bit more than the average politician. Um, and so it, it, it hurts us as a community, certainly, because there are less voices nationally. Uh, there are, you know, with just being less veterans altogether, less military, there's less in Congress. We have, you know, we have less governors. We have less elected officials at the state. We have less mayors and local governors. We have less, um, you know, influential CEOs. There's just less and less and less of us. And as time goes on, there is a concern that, you know, things that may have been needed are going to get overlooked for the broader population. Um, because of cost. Mm -hmm. And so that's something that I think, you know, in, in terms of advocacy that we in the veterans community really need to look at is how do we unify what voices we have left into making sure that the big ticket items get pushed through without losing sight of the little ticket items too. Um, as there are more groups of, of specialized veterans needs, we don't want their issues and thoughts and things to be overheard either um, when we're doing advocacy. So you, you, we got to figure out how to balance the two. Yeah, I mean, I would, I would uh, certainly agree with that. I think, um, without getting too far off topic, right? The the military teaches you um, how to work with people from different backgrounds and pushing uh, the the same rock up the hill to achieve the mission. Uh, and I think that's a, a very, uh, you know, that skill translates very well. Uh, I would imagine to Congress, right, or any sort of legislative body. Um, and I think that the kind of the hyper-partisanship that we find ourselves in, in in this country right now, um, you know, uh, leads to people not wanting to negotiate because they are trying to get reelected, right? So I think that that, I think those are two things that are, that are uh, making it difficult um, uh, to pass legislation in this country. And I think that, yeah, I think that more veterans would obviously have a vested interest uh, in caring about advocacy and policies that, that directly um, benefit uh, the veterans of of you know all war war eras and, and veterans of service uh, whether they it was war related or not, um, and I think that there there has to be um, a bit of a, a bit of a reckoning and a bit of an understanding that you know this is the cost of war right mm -hmm. this is this is included in that whole package when you signed off and you said and whether it's civilian support or or you know whether you had a vote to go to war or not, or whether you supported it as a civilian. You know this is this is part of that cost. It's not just um, the blood and treasure that that occurs in the war zone or supporting that effort. It's taking care of the veterans when they come home as well, um, because that is going to be 
whether it's physical or mental health or spiritual, um, those are those are uh, direct effects of of what that war uh, and what that or what that conflict uh, inflicted upon those people who were fighting it. Um, mm-hmm. So there's no that it, and it's and it's a shame sometimes um, that uh, sometimes it, it feels like politicians have to be shamed into remembering that uh, to get some of this legislation passed when we're trying to advocate for veterans. So yeah, I would I would. Uh, certainly agree that, you know, maybe more veterans in in our legislative bodies of all levels would would probably help move that along. Dwight, what do you see in your township? Uh, As a township manager, uh, you know, listening to the voices out there, uh, what bubbles up from the community that you feel like needs to be pushed up to the national level? Well, that's an interesting question. So what bubbles up about veterans? uh, where I'm at, and, and mind you that we're in one of the most heavily populated veterans communities in the country is nothing. And, and I think that's a, that's a problem, right? Yeah. So you go to the VFW, you go to the VA, you go to these veterans groups where, you know, me, Ryan, Jess, we've all known each other for years. All we do is talk veterans issues and talk this. You go out to the average American street and ask them what issues are going on within the veteran space or, you know, are our veterans taken care of? I think would be a more apt question. Most will give you a mixed answer of, I don't really know. Maybe we think so. We hope so. But they don't, oftentimes they don't kind of really know, you know, what, what it goes into to take to have to have a war, the sacrifices that come with that, and then what it takes to care for those people coming back. And I think what makes our time unique is, you know, you'd ask the question about how is advocacy today different from the Vietnam generation? You know, the American population was very involved. You know, they were against the war, but they weren't very involved. They knew about it. They, they, you know, they protested against it. It was televised daily. You know, we've been at war essentially for 20 years. And after a certain couple of years, you know, you saw most of the mainstream um, kind of media conversations around it go away. You would hear a couple of things here and there. Um, you know, if somebody got killed, that would be on screen. But the kind of day-to-day coverage that, that used to happen when a war was around doesn't happen. We haven't had rationings. We haven't had war bonds. The American public largely just got to say this small population is dealing with these issues over here. And that's kind of where it has left. And, you know, I, I don't hear nearly enough about what can we do to help other than thank you for your service? And, you know, which is a nice sentiment, but it oftentimes brings hollow. And the, it would be nice to see more of the American public engaged in what happens to our military members after they get out of the service. It's interesting too, because I mean, everybody says, you know, support the vets or in Congress, even, you know, you'd ask probably any Congressman, you know, do you support the vets? And yeah, yeah, I do. But when it comes to the rubber meeting the road, what is the what is the the stopping point? Where 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 do you find that you have, I say stub your toe and, and can't get something across? Like, is it have to do with money? Is it have to do with support? Is it have to do with votes? Uh, what stops some of this legislation from from getting past the yeah I support the vets, but well, what we're usually told is it has some combination of either to do with government overreach or budget or something along those lines. You know, mm-hmm. what it really is is hard to say. I, you know, I think it depends on the, the, the time who you're talking to, what the actual legislation is. There might be other things, you know, there's a difference if it's a standalone legis- legislation versus an omnibus, right? You know, uh, and what's the easier, difference there? Well, a standalone legislation would be like a single bill, right? We're passing a, a single, we want uh, all veterans named Ryan to have free college, right? So that's, Boom, nice and simple, right? <laughs> um, versus an omnibus where it would be multiple pieces of veterans legislation lumped together. So you might have something about, you know, we're gonna, you know, get all that stuff for Ryan, that's great, but then we're going to also make sure that every veteran has a service dog and we're gonna make sure that every hospital has X, Y, and Z. And so as you start tacking on more things, mm-hmm. it's easier to find objection with one of those items amongst this multiple list and say, you know what, I just can't support this because of this one item. And it, and it is a much easier pass for politicians who might disagree for multiple reasons um, to do. And, and I should be fair here too. Some of these things do have legitimate cost concerns, right? So, um, you know, nobody's arguing 
we should just write a, a, a blank check for things. But what we are arguing is it should be at least taken at face value and should be discussed seriously and, and considered and discussed with veterans groups um, and individuals, not just an arbitrary, it costs too much and shutting down the conversation after that. Um, there's always room for negotiation. And oftentimes we don't see that for a multitude of reasons. Right. And that's, you know, that's a very large uh, concern, I'm sure. Like if the VFW comes to Congress and says, we need this, like, okay, are they just supposed to take their word for it? No. I mean, like Congress at a certain point has a, you know, they have to gather data. They have to make sure that that is in fact a need and that this is the best way to take care of it. So there's lots of different pieces to that for sure. Um, uh, I think that that might, yeah, where, where does it, where does it stop? Where does it end? I mean, you know, my gut kind of tells me like most of it probably, you know, could be cost related, you know, mm -hmm. um, but, you know, who know, but again, the whole legislative process is, is, a, is a long one and, and <laughs> I'm sure it's very difficult and I'm sure they really want to make sure that it is not only, you know, uh, properly um, written, but it has to be properly executed, right? Like, we referred to like the VA, why most people think about the VA. And it's typically because like, that's typically the tool that is going to be used to implement a lot of these policies or, or benefits or adjustments, right? So like they, they have to look at, if, if we all agree on, on, let's just, we all agree that veterans should get service dogs, right? Okay, how much is it gonna cost? Okay, we're cool with that. Okay, well, where are the dogs gonna come from? Who are gonna get the dogs to the veterans, right? Like who's gonna train the dogs, right? And then there's a whole implementation piece um, to a lot of these things that, that could be a huge holdup, right? Like when you're trying to, it can be difficult to fix things in one township, let alone, let yeah. alone saying like, let's, let's do this across the country, right? How is that going to work? How is that process going to work? Um, so when you're advocating for, for veterans and, and what that's going to look like it, you know, uh, the, the execution piece of it, um, can sometimes be a, a huge stumbling block, right? And if, I'll say too, Sean, I mean, it's it's an interesting time too, just for advocacy in terms of, I, I don't know that we've ever had such a diverse range of, of ages and demographics in the veterans community. I mean, we've got, you know, 18 year olds and 102 year olds mm -hmm. that are still in the spectrum and, and their needs are different. And so, you know, what what one bill may introduce to help, you know, one group or I, you know, it was supposed to help the entire group, you might have pockets that object to it for some reason. Yeah. Um, whether that is the younger veterans, the older veterans, you might have, um, there's, there's a whole slew of veterans who, who believe the VA should just be dissolved and send everything to the private care. For the record, I am not on board with that, but it, it, it does exist. Um, there are veterans who want like a hybrid of the VA and private care. There are other veterans who say, no, no outside care at all, move everything to the VA. Mm -hmm. So it, I think it could be hard for politicians to, to navigate that. If, and it depends on where you're at, right? What part of the country you live in. So you might have a part of the country that's very pro-VA. You might have some that's very anti-VA, pro-private sector. You might have some that, you know, depending on who has the kind of the clout in town and the politicians' ears and things like that, maybe telling them something that's contrary to the popular opinion of most veterans. So it, I think it can be really difficult to gauge where um, you know, where you need to put a stop on the legislation and where you need to kind of don't listen to the naysayers and push things through. Mm -hmm. That seems like one of the more hot button sort of topics that's being debated right now is whether to auto enroll everyone. Is there any, is there anything else coming through or, or in the pipeline that it's like, uh, you know, it could go either way and many people are against it. Many people are for it. And how, you know, how, how, what does it look like? Yeah, there's, there's always a couple different things. And there's some things that we see repeatedly. Um, mm -hmm. You know, again, um, unfortunately, I'm, I'm sad that we're still having discussions about Agent Orange. Um, mm -hmm. You know, my, my dad was a Vietnam veteran. I lost my uncle um, a year and a half ago to Agent Orange. He was a Blue Water Navy veteran. And he waited 50 years before he could finally get disability benefits for Agent Orange related issues because he served on a ship within 50 nautical miles of the coast or the coast of Vietnam. And for years, VA said, no, 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 no. Congress said, no, 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 no. And they finally said, yes. And by the time that we even started his claim, unfortunately he passed away. Um, you know, so things like that are gonna continue to be issues. Uh, I know for our generation, you're gonna have burn pits. I dealt a lot with the first Gulf War 
Um, as a county director, we have a significant number of veterans who are still trying to get Gulf War syndrome, which is really like an umbrella term for kind of multiple issues that, that they have, but it has become a kind of bureaucratic nightmare for these veterans with the VA to get care for Gulf War syndrome because their definitions, um, you know, it has to be an undiagnosed illness. Well, but there's also a list of things that says are typical Gulf War syndromes like GI issues and certain things. And so what we're running into is, you know, you'll, you'll have three of these diagnosed symptoms that are like typical, which would say, okay, well, you meet three of like five typical symptoms, therefore you should have Gulf War syndrome. VA will come back and say, sorry, that is a diagnosed syndrome and we have to have an undiagnosed syndrome so you don't have Gulf War syndrome. Or they'll turn around and do the opposite. And, and you can contest that and sometimes you can win and there's veterans, uh, you know, there's a veterans court that you can go to and you can mm -hmm. appeal these things, but it, it's very cumbersome and bureaucratic. And so there's always kind of time consuming going. and all of that stuff with the not many veterans can probably have the energy or the time or, you know, yeah, to do. Right. And so oftentimes there's legislation that, that goes through that tries to clean up the disability process. And we see this every couple of years. They just passed one not too, too long ago about how um, appeals are done. There was a, an appeals reform act and it streamlined some things, but um, you know, they're trying to, to clean up some of the kind of the healthcare um what they consider for disabilities, what they add to the presumptive list. And so we will continue to see these things, you know, as long as we have a VA system, unless it has radically changed, these are things that are going to pop up every so many years or years or every time there's a new war, yeah. whether there's a new issue, um, burn pits again for us and so on and so forth. And, you know, it can be kind of hard to predict that, but hopefully we'll learn our lessons from previous generations and we won't wait 50 years to pass legislation to to get veterans the care that they need ryan um yeah as somebody who's coming up on retirement or did you retire oh, yeah <laughs> are you coming up on that ryan well uh 20 years and 20 years will be uh in about two weeks oh you're making boy. me feel old man I, I remember when you went in from enlisted the officer i know it was a long time ago <laughs> Well, as someone who's coming up on retirement, then, you know, you're going to retire from the military. Is, is veteran advocacy something that you keep, uh, keep the pulse of, uh, that you check in on? Um, you're a very well read, you know, veteran already. Um, but, you know, is, is, is that something that means something to you being a veteran yourself? Yeah, um, for sure. I think that uh, um, so many of these issues are so frustrating for veterans because as you as you can imagine right like take Dwight's example um you're a veteran who was in the Gulf War and you develop GI issues like now you need to prove to the VA that not only do you have GI issues but that they were related to your service and I think that that's that's what's really you know difficult so uh, how do we improve the process and improve the manner in which we care for these veterans right like and that takes research that takes time that takes being proactive um, and we all know that that type of stuff is is difficult to do right it's it typically tends to be reactive oh we've realized a problem has become so big that we can no longer ignore it so we have to do something about it and i think that that's that's really difficult and it's the nature of of service as well right i mean when you join the military you are a a, a tool to be used until you can no longer kind of accomplish uh, that function. Um, and then there's problems. So then now we have to deal with it, right? Like, I think the military is starting to, to adjust um, and take and try to take better care of their service members um, so that these sort of things don't happen. But the military is a large institution and very slow to change. So we may not start seeing the benefits of these changes for another generation, you know? Um, so, Advocacy, yes, it, 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 I, I try to, to stay on top of what's going on, what are the issues, not only in my personal life, but in my work life, um, to, to make sure that, you know, I can, you know, speak somewhat intelligently to veterans who have questions about those, about those things. So as I, as I come into, uh, you know, into retirement and then leaving the service, I have always been enrolled in the VA. I think it's important that veterans do that. Uh, because it costs them nothing and you don't have to pay anything at all unless you use it. So it's, it's always good to, 
to have that option available to you. Um, so yeah, I, to answer your question, I, I, I do think it's important. It, it is something that I, I think that veterans should pay attention to because it, it can have very tangible benefits um, in their life. Probably wasn't something you thought of when you first enlisted. No, I mean, when you're young, you're just like, nothing hurts you ever. Like, you don't care. You're like, what am I, why do I care about that? That's not, you know, 20 years down the road. And then all of a sudden, you know, your back hurts all the time and can't sleep and whatever. So you're just <laughs> like, when did this happen? Right. I get, you know, you know, and, and that's just, but that's just the way it goes. Right. I mean, um, you get old and, uh, and sometimes the military makes you grow, grow older a little faster. Right. And, and uh, you know, the, that famous Indiana Jones quote, right. It's, it's not the age, honey, it's the mileage. Right. <laughs> right. Dwight, what, what, at what point did you start to get passionate about veteran advocacy? Well, uh, after I got out and I, 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 I got hurt when I was in um, pretty bad. Uh, I, had, I had planned on making a career out of the Marine Corps. I, I was young, headstrong. I had Marines was it. There was no plan B. There was no plan C. And when I was forced into a situation of you can no longer do this, um, I, I struggled a bit when I got out. Um, you know, with pain management, with, with surgeries, with um, I, yeah, education, young things like, I, you know, I had no experience doing anything. Mm -hmm. um, and it was um, some of the older veterans in the veterans community where I went to college at that actually kind of took me under their wing. And it, it was right before the new GI Bill came out and um, kind of steered me in a direction. And it, it was at that point that I said, you know, there's people who've been through this before me that, that really helped me and I don't know where I'd be without them. And so when I was in college, I started a, um, a VA work study position and I said, well, maybe I can help some of the other people that are coming after me. And it kind of, kind of morphed, um, in, in, into where I'm at today from that. Okay. What do you think was the biggest, um, program or piece of adv advocacy that personally benefited you? Good question. Oh, that's a good question. Um, I'm, 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 I'm going to go with two. So um, because they both had, I think, equally substantial impact on my life. Um, and I wouldn't be where I am today without either one of them. So one is GI Bill um, that allowed for me to go to school while I was married with a 10 month old. Um, otherwise, you know, that wouldn't have happened. Um, and two is the healthcare and the healthcare is something I still use to this day. And as, as somebody who has routinely struggled with pain management from, from service injuries, um, if I had to pay for that in the private sector, I, I would be in medical debt. There's no way that I could cover the cost. Not only that, but my care has been, has been great. Um, you know, I've had options available to me that most people in the private sector would never get that opportunity or option to, to just say, Hey, you know what, this isn't working. Let's try this. And in, in, in the private sector, if you have the money to do that, great. But, you know, young, I, I didn't have the money for an experimental drug or an experimental surgery or wherever. Um, and, and the VA allowed me to do that. And I'm able to function as a um, member of society today because of those two things. Yeah, absolutely. That's great. Why would anybody be against veteran advocacy? And have you come across anybody like that? Yes. Yeah. It doesn't happen often, but yeah. But yes. <laughs> um, <clears throat> yeah. So there are people that are against everything. I mean, you, you, you somebody finds a cure to cancer, somebody somewhere is going to be mad about it. Um, but that being said, um, I've actually, um, I've had some experiences from people who were um, not, ne not necessarily anti-advocacy, but they were anti-war, which then translated to anti-veteran and therefore anti-veteran policy and advocacy. They, their, their point of view was veterans shouldn't be necessary and veterans policy shouldn't be necessary because we shouldn't be having war. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and, and I can respect their point of view and disagree. Um, I've had other individuals who were concerned that um, veterans groups were wielding too much influence 
and that they were doing nefarious things with taxpayer dollars, mm -hmm. whether or not that's true. You know, so there were all kinds of things that I've come across in, in the last you know 15 years of kind of being in the veteran space for people pro and and kind of con for veterans advocacy. Most people are pro um, veteran advocacy, pro veterans legislation. They they just kind of differ on the details. You know whether that should be care at the VA or care in the private sector. Uh, whether that should be you know. GI Bill dollars at this amount or GI Bill dollars at this amount. You know, it, it's mm -hmm. not so much really, um, at least from what I've seen in, in kind of the large sphere of people against veterans policy and advocacy. The the gears of legislation work very slowly, but Dwight, how do you how do you stay focused? Oh, I don't. <laughs> it can be hard. Um, so you have to kind of keep in mind of big ticket items in, in, in what you see in policy and legislation is, you know, you have some constant players. You've, you've got some of these same congressmen, senators, um, national commanders that, that are kind of in the space consistently. And, and those are the people that, you know, really can kind of get things done. But then you also have a whole bunch of people that come in and out. And, and you have to catch those people up to speed and you have to work with them and they might have new ideas or try something a little bit differently. And you have to pick and choose your battles and you have to really push the ones that are big ticket items um, again. So, you know, the, the Vietnam veterans had spent 50 years pressing politicians from every walk of life for Agent Orange and, and their kids and they instilled it in their kids and their kids went out and advocated. Um, so, I mean, you have to play the long game for political change and for legislation change. Uh, Jess had noted it's been 20 years almost um, for military sexual trauma and it's still still not anywhere near where it needs to be. And so it's probably gonna be honestly another 10, 15, 20 years before it's up to where it needs to be. And it's unfortunate, but you know, those of us in the veterans community can't lose sight of, of keeping to pushing and, and making it better. Mm -hmm. um, but we also need to be agile enough to, to pivot to some smaller things too and, and push some things at the local level, whether that's advocate, you know, advocating at the county level, the state level. It's not always just about, you know, the congressional level. Um, there's a lot of quality of life and things that can be done at the local level too. Do you think, uh, Dwight, there's like the same amount of um, passion or involvement in uh, these types of advocacy from veterans of global war on terrorism as, as there was with Vietnam, right? You, just like you talked about, like Vietnam, they were very much in it, uh, the Vietnam veterans. Um, no. And no, yeah, for, and right. for, for me, there seems to be not as much from global war on yep. terrorism veterans. No, I, I think you're right. Um, and I, I, it, it's sad. I think, I think part of it is, is just the sheer numbers, right? We just, there's not as many of us, um, I think, too, that we have it substantially better than the Vietnam veterans. That doesn't mean that we shouldn't keep advocating to, to make it better. But comparatively, um, you know, when things are really bad, they had a, a rightful reason to be a little bit louder, to advocate a little bit more. Sure. Uh, but no, I, I think there's I think there's less of us. I think there's less of us that are in these types of positions. And I also think that we're. We're suffering from kind of. Uh, we're fracturing a bit, right? So you have your traditional veterans groups who do a lot of legislative advocacy, but then you have a lot of newer groups. Mission continues, Team Red, White, and Blue, and they're they're great. Don't get me wrong; they're wonderful. I, I like them all. They but they don't typically focus on legislative advocacy. They're more grassroots. They're more community. So they're doing much needed work in terms of like helping repair schools. They're they're bringing out um, food pantries, things like that. But we're still now missing that piece of legislation because their efforts are focused down here. You've got less and less being focused up at the national level. And so I, yeah, I, I think there's less involvement from our generation and, and it's, it's a concern um, again, because there's less voice, which means less policy, less uh, congressmen and women to listen. And, and so I, slowly but surely we are, we are losing our voice. Um, in the country from, from where I'm sitting. Is there a particular uh, congressman or woman 
who you look to and say they're doing it right. And that'd be like, you know, kind of advice for civilians as well. If, if someone's interested in, in jumping into veteran advocacy, who would they look to to say, you know, that person is really pre pressing for, for smart and, and helpful legislation? I would like to say that. Um, we have congressmen and women, we have elected officials on both sides who are doing really great work. Mm -hmm. um, but frankly, it's not enough. We have um, things that are often dropped or they're not pushed when there might be other priorities. And, I, and, I, and don't get me wrong, you know, veterans are not the only group that congressmen and women are responsible for. Mm -hmm. um, but I feel um, as, a, as a global war on terror veteran that they have a particular duty to make sure that they take care of those men and women that they placed in harm's way to defend everyone else. And that often gets a back seat to the larger populace. And so, you know, again, we have some great advocates in the veterans community that are legislators, but they all need to do a better job. Mm -hmm. And also if I'm a civilian looking into veteran advocacy, uh, is it kind of like choose your own adventure and I'm gonna really put my you know, energy behind like uh, you know, burn pits and I wanna make sure that, that veterans get you know, uh, their, their benefits for this particular thing? Uh, or is there something that, that kind of broad scope everybody needs? I, actually, I, I like your, your analogy there. I think it is kind of a choose your own adventure. There's, there's enough issues to go around. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I guess I would argue you know, find something that you're, you're passionate about, find a connection. You know, if you had a, a relative that was involved in something, um, you know, Vietnam, pick a Vietnam issue, pick Agent Orange. If you, you know, are, you know, if you are really volunteering for like homeless shelters, you know, pick a, a veterans homeless um, kind of policy thing and go from there. If, you know, if all else fails and, and you just have no idea what to do or where to go, you know, contact the VFW, the DAV, most every state has a veterans division at the state level. Most states have county veterans directors who are usually pretty well plugged in and well versed. Mm -hmm. And so you can go talk to them and, and they can point you like in the right direction. They can hook you up with these other veterans groups. They're, they're usually pretty easy to find because they're state level and county level uh, individuals that, you know, mm -hmm. websites, phone numbers, all of that is out there. Um, and you can also go to the VA, you know, every Every state has a VA, depends on where you're at and how accessible they are. But they have webs, you know, of course, a pretty nationally known website, and you can get an idea of who to contact from there and, um, you know, go from there. But it, it, the, the veterans community definitely needs the rest of the help from the United States in order to advance legislation and things for, you know, current veterans, future veterans, military, it, it, it is all definitely needed. We need the entire United States to come behind the men and women who serve to make sure that, you know, we are, are going to have men and women who want to serve in the future. Mm -hmm. Part of our, our, our military policy at the moment relies on volunteers, an all-volunteer force. And you darn well better have good policies and services for when you get out of the service and when you're in the service for people to want to volunteer to go to war. And so, you know, it's, it's in the interest of everybody if we have good policy and programs for veterans. Mm -hmm. Well, Dwight, uh, this has been great. Uh, uh, Brian, I wanna uh, hand off to you also. Uh, any, any final parting thoughts? Uh, yeah, I mean, the care of, of our veterans is, is extremely important. Um, and uh, I just, if I could leave our listeners with, you know, one thought, um, you know, to, to be involved uh, in those decisions um, when it's coming up time to, you know, utilize military force, uh, because it, as we just discussed, there are, there are many costs and many, uh, many issues that, are, that arise, and it doesn't just end with, with when they come home from uh, the conflict that they were sent to. So uh, that should be included in your thought process of whether you're going to support um, a future conflict or future use of force. Uh, just, you know, make sure that it's worth it. And Dwight, uh, I want to thank you for coming on the scuttlebutt. Also, Jess, who uh, was with us at the beginning. Uh, Dwight, um, any, any parting thoughts before we, before we wrap up here? No, I just want to say thank you for having me on. Uh, Ryan, always good to see you, and I, and I hope you enjoy retirement shortly. 
<laughs> and I know you're going to file for your 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 benefits, right? As soon as you get out on retirement, they're, are, they're already in. They're already yeah, in. Yeah. So, um, no, thank you so much. Veterans Breakfast Club is is a wonderful group, and and you know what? In terms of advocacy, Sean, I think Veterans Breakfast Club has has done a lot for the veterans community in a way that nobody could have predicted when this first started. So, you know, kudos to you, kudos to Todd and everybody involved with Veterans Breakfast Club and, and keep doing the good work that you guys are doing. Of course, definitely. And we'd love to have you back on the scuttlebutt, especially as different things come up uh, through legislation. If there's something that, that you uh, want to talk about more specifically uh, in the veteran advocacy space, uh, I'd love you to be able to use this platform as a, as a way to get the word out um, and, uh, you know, however you need to. Great. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you to our listeners. Make sure you like, share, subscribe, ring the bell on YouTube and send me uh, an email at Sean, S-H-A-U-N at veteransbreakfastclub.org. If you have any thoughts or questions for Dwight or Ryan um, or myself uh, in terms of veter veteran advocacy, uh, we're always interested to hear uh, what our listeners are thinking. And uh, we will catch you next week on a new episode of The Scuttlebutt. <laughs>